Some people like to listen to music. Some people enjoy music. Some people like to read. Some people like to play sport. Some people like to exercise and go to the gym. And I can't go past it, I know, John. Maxine, yeah. Maxine, we know the story of Maxine, don't we? Maxine said she stopped calling the bathroom the job. She's <laughs> calling it Jim. Oh, because it sounds so much better when she goes to her friends and say, I went to the gym this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Some people like grandkids. <laughs> they enjoy them. They have fun with them. Some people like cooking. Some people like cooking because in this place we have many people who love their cooking and they are so good at it. I could mention names which I won't do but that would leave somebody out. But, you know, when you go and walk up to the table and have morning tea, we're so blessed. It's so great, isn't it? And, of course, we have things like... Um, Impossible pie, so I won't mention names or anything like that. But it's good, isn't it? Because what's what's eating? Eating involves three senses, doesn't it? Sight, smell, and taste. Well, that might be just a good segue into how I'm going to look at a reading today. So that's what it's all about. We're going to look at the main course. And Kim's going to bring up the reading for us now. As you can see, Luke 10, 18 to 42, Jesus visits Martha and Mary. And as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him to her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you see it seems unfair that my sister just sits and while I do all the work tell her to come help me but the Lord said to her Martha, dear Martha you are worried and upset over all these things there's only one thing worth being concerned about Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. I just want to um, say that sometimes we do use the modern translations today. I was reading it in the message and I liked it in that, but we're looking at the New Living Translation today. And I suppose... Fifty years ago, I would have been slapped around the ears if I even talked about reading from a translation. You had to read from the Bible, the King James Version. Even though we did have some translations, 
You see, I have the privilege or the license, because I'm so old, that you allow me to just reflect on the past a little bit. And so we did have Moffat, and we did have Phillips, and then they had the full Bible and the Revised Standard, which came out first. So, if I'm wrong, all you scholars will correct me. But I just want to leave this thought with you before we get into the meat of it. Paul says in Philippians 2, thank you, Kim, if we can have that one. Philippians 2, 14 to 15. See? Do everything without complaining and arguing. That's all I want to say. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Okay, so just remember that first verse. What I wanted to do today was perhaps go with me in the RNS version, the Ron's translation of the story. And that's what you're getting this morning. So it's just my version of what really happened from that day. So if you'll go with me, and we'll just have a quick look at the kitchen. We're going to have a look through the door. As the script said, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. As he goes through the little village of Bethany, Martha runs out because she knew him and she's had him as friends with her sister and her brother Lazarus. And so she says, come on in, come on in, and uh, I'll make a meal. So he goes. So now we're just going to have a quick look into the kitchen and see what's going on. And as we look through the back door, what do we see? We see tables piled high with food of all sorts. There's dishes, and there seems to be a lot of flour everywhere. There's a lot of heat and steam because the open kitchen fire was all they had. Western House wasn't around then. And so there's a, there's a plate on there with, with food cooking on it. There were pots hanging above the fire. And so everything was going along great. But there's only one person in there. There's only one person. And out through the steam, you can see this woman standing at the table, flour covered everywhere on the table. There's flour on her arms, there's flour on her apron and clothes, and there's flour on her forehead where she had wiped the sweat away with flour covered hands. But I'm just going to creep a little bit closer. The woman was called Martha. And she starts muttering to herself. I just want to hear what she's going to say. Thought she could have stayed a little bit longer, you know. Just like her, wanting to get out there and swam around with all the guys. Who does she think she is? Katy Perry? Well, for my generation. Audrey Hepburn? <laughs> <laughs> Leaving me here, working like a dog in this kitchen. It's hot. And then, I didn't think he'd bring them all. The disciples, boy, can they eat. Particularly that Peter guy, he's a big guy. Sweet little sister. Me and he, working like a draft horse. Well, you know, there's only so much we can take. So with that, she downs her hands, wipes them on a towel, Red face, <clears throat> heads off into the main room. Can you see the scene? She walks through the door into this next room where everybody was. This large woman, red face, flower covered, hands and face, glaring. Glaring at the sister Mary. Lord, verse 4. Don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left me alone to do all this work? 
Tell her to help me. Suddenly, the room that was buzzing with warmth, fellowship and conversation had gone deadly quiet. There was not a sound. The disciples all of a sudden found they had a problem with their feet. They had to look at them and discover what was the problem. Mary, red of face, now was staring at the floor. No one said a word. But Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus knew. Jesus spoke. Because only Jesus understood the problem. The problem was not Martha's choice to have Jesus come with his disciples. Wasn't even the problem of Mary's choice. Because Mary's choice was the right one. Who wouldn't take that opportunity to be with the Lord and to sit there and listen to what he had to say? I mean, if I had an invitation to go and meet with Don Bradman and have a one-to-one -one with him, I'd have to choose. And what would I choose? It's a no-brainer, isn't it? You'd have to come and sit with the Lord's feet. If you had an appointment with the Queen for your 150th birthday, wouldn't that be wonderful? You'd have to choose if you're invited. No. The problem was not Mary's choice. Hers was the right one. Even though, even though it was very unusual in Galilean society in 30 AD, for a 30-something young, unattached woman to be with all the guys walking around, following them. That was pretty unusual. But the problem was not Martha's choice to host. The problem was Martha's heart. The problem was Martha's heart. She knew what was involved when she invited Jesus to come. She knew what she had to do. She knew that there's no coals or woodies around the corner where she can race down and grab some rolls and some bread. No, she had to make everything right from the beginning. And she knew that. It wasn't rocket science. It was duck science. No, it wasn't rocket science at all. Because she knew what was involved. She'd done it so many times before. She knew the bread had to be made. She knew the rolls had to be made. The little date cakes had to be cooked. The salads had to be prepared. She knew about all that. No. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. I'm indebted to Max Licardo for the thought because in his book, He Still Moves Stones, he just recorded uh, a few impressions of this story and that got me thinking. And so I've made it uh, my own as I just... Uh, well, I'll just use a couple of clips from what he was saying in that book. And one of them is, was this. He said this. Bless her heart, Martha wanted to do right. But bless her heart, her heart wasn't right. Jesus said she was worried. As a result, she turned from a happy servant into a beast of burden. She was worried. She was worried about the cooking. She was worried about pleasing. She was worried about too much. And he says, I like my favourite theologian, Irma Bombeck, who wrote a book about worry. And she says, I've always worried. And frankly, I'm very good at it. I worry about introducing people and coming to my mother and getting a blank. I worry about a snake coming up through the drain into the kitchen sink. I worry about the world ending in, at midnight and I've just taken a 24-hour coal capsule and I'm only three hours into it. I worry about getting into the Guinness Book of Records under pregnancy 
as the oldest recorded birth. I worry what the dog thinks when he sees me get out of the shower. That is a worry. And I worry that scientists dis has now discovered that lettuce has been fattening all along. <laughs> Unquote. You know, that's what worry does. It makes you forget who's in charge. It makes you forget who's in charge. Apparently, Martha worried so much that she started bossing God around. You know? Lord, tell her, tell this lazy sister of mine to get off her behind and give me a hand. That's what she was saying. Worry makes you do that. Makes you forget who's in charge. You want to talk about worry? I'll tell you a, a small story which you know. It's the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, I won't go into all the details because it'll be brief and I'll be getting chopped in the neck because it'll be too long. But just briefly, the story of Jacob and Esau. You know that with his mother Rachel, Jacob stole the birthright from his brother Esau. Tricked his father Isaac into getting it because he's nearly blind and so on and so on. And it was so important in those days to get a birthright. But he stole it from his older brother who was right the father. Well then after he got it, he fled and he shot off for about 30 or 40 years and he hadn't seen Esau. But now he heard that Esau was coming. Esau was coming to meet him. Talk about worry. He was not worried. He was panicking. So much so that he couldn't even sleep. He was trying to organise everything. He had divided his whole estate and family into half. He'd sent half away to be in a safe position. He sent another half towards Esau as a gift of his family, of his wives, of his children, of his flock and everything. He was doing everything he could think of. And then that night before, he had a wrestle with an angel of the Lord. And he had to give in. He had to give in because he realised that he couldn't do it. He had to let God take control. And so he did. He said, I can't do it, it's up to you, God. Now. I accept your will. So I want to read. I want to read Genesis 30. Wonderful. Thanks. Jacob and Esau make peace. So then Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel and his servants and wives. He put the servants, wives and children at the front. Leah and her children next and Rachel and Joseph last. Then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. Then Esau came up to him, met him, embraced him, and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. See what happens when God's in control? God was in control now. He left it all with God. After all those years, God was now in control. But you know, sometimes it happens in our prayer life. So when Hughes said this, many false views about your prayer life and we can just share some at the moment. Some unfounded views that come from our worries. One is that through prayer we can change the mind of God so that his will coincides with ours. What nonsense, he says. 
The purpose of prayer is not to bend the will of God to our will, but it is to bring our will in line with His. Unquote. It's the Martha telling God what to do. But you know, when you look at it in one sense, you now Martha is worried about something good. Martha's worried about something good because she's having Jesus, she's having God for dinner. And so she really wants to make it the best she can. She wants to serve God with the, all she's got, with the best that she can do. What would you do? If at five o'clock tonight you have a knock on the door and it's Jesus and says, you've got a spare chair for the night, what would you do? Ah, some cheese on toast. <laughs> Vegemite sandwich? No, you might not be to Oh, I'll put some soup on. I tell you what, I'd even get my prawns out. <laughs> you would make sure that you went down or got somebody down the road to get the way to the beef or to get the best that you could. You want to give him second best? No. I'd get Renee to come and cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? It wasn't bad, was it? What she was trying to do. But, you know, Martha. Martha was trying to please Jesus, but she made a common mistake. A very dangerous one. The work became more important than her work. The work became more important than her law. Slowly and subtly, you know, it became a way of serving and honouring herself. <laughs> and one little quote from Max, he says, Martha, as she was preparing the food, was perhaps anticipating that she would get the compliments after that Jesus would perhaps instruct the disciples, guys, she needs a round of applause. And she thought, well, John's writing a new book. He'll have a chapter in there about servanthood. And I'll figure in it. Women will come for miles around to find out how she could be such a kind and such a wonderful servant. But things didn't turn out Things didn't turn out that way. There was no compliments. There was no applause. Martha, long on anxiety, but short on memory. She forgot that she had invited Jesus. She forgot that Mary had every right to sit at the feet of Jesus. This was to honour Jesus, not Martha. He said, I know, because I have been in Martha's kitchen or Max's office. And quote. Has that happened to any of you? It's happened to me. And I've been standing on a trestle swinging outside the, the church at Stafford and wondering where everybody else is and painting and painting and there's nobody around. And You know what? Satan doesn't do it hard enough to make me want to go away from church. No. But what he'll do, he'll disillusion you. And that's what he loves to do. He loves to disillusion us. So we forget who's in charge. We forget who we're honouring by our service, by our cooking, by our cutting the lawn or whatever we're doing. He seeks to disillusion us to think we're the only ones. 
We're not being appreciated. So perhaps when it comes to a meal to honour Jesus, let's substitute meal for our ministry. And I know Michael would not be happy <coughs> if I hadn't finished with a quote from Warren Wesley. Correct? Warren says this, Martha's problem was not that she had too much to do, but she allowed her work to distract her and put her apart. She was trying to serve two masters, serving if, he said, serving Christ makes us difficult to live with, then there is something terribly wrong <coughs> with our service. Unquote. So, the key to the right priorities surely must be this. Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. It's vitally important for each of us to want to sit at the feet of Jesus every day. The most important part of the Christian's Life is the part that no one sees, but it's the part that only God sees. It's the heart. And according to John 12, 1 to 2, Martha must have learned her lesson, for she prepared a feast for Jesus and the twelve. And there are also her siblings also there. But you know, Martha now had God's peace in her heart. And she too had learned now to sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen.